Last week I shared about on the topic of solitude, and I'm going to continue to share there this morning, about solitude, about this replenishing, this rejuvenating, this renewal of our souls, of our hearts. And the idea of solitude, what is solitude? Solitude is being alone. It's the absence of distractions. Does anybody have any distractions in their life? It's, it's an inner yearning for renewal. You know, this, this world throws so much at us, it's so easy to get off on the wrong things. But we find that when we are most by ourselves, we experience God in deeper ways. This idea of solitude can be very, very difficult to find. And I talked about how busy we are, and some of, some of you have children, and you're running them this place, you're running them to, to this place. Some have kids in different schools, so you gotta run from one school, then they're in athletic events, or maybe you have a job, maybe you have a couple jobs. We have so many things being thrown at us all the time. And so solitude can be very difficult to find, but when we find it, it's because we went after it, because we've sought after it, it's been an intentional thing. Isolation, on the other hand, can be very easy to find. And it's usually found unintentionally. This morning I'm speaking to someone who has gone through some of these things, but also someone as a minister I've counseled and prayed with people who have found themselves isolated from their support system, from their friends, from men and women of God. And that wasn't the direction they originally started out on, but that's where they ended up. How many of you know sometimes we unintentionally end up in places that we never would have wanted to go, but we find ourselves there? So last week we talked about how solitude is this time of renewal and encountering God. This week we want to talk a little bit about isolation, the destruction, the darkness that it comes with. If you have not lived under a rock for the past year or so, if you have maybe some kids or grandkids, you've heard of a movie called Frozen. And in this movie, Frozen, it's about two queens, Anna and Elsa. Elsa's the blonde-haired one, Anna's the, the orange-haired one. And Elsa has some power. She, can, she has power over ice and snow. And so she builds this snowman called Olaf in the movie. And in this movie, in this scene in particular, they're, they're playing with a snowman that she's created, and, and she's able to, with her hand, just kind of make ice form out of nowhere, make snowman's foam form out of nowhere. And so she's doing that, and her sister gets going too fast, and she accidentally, instead of making ice or snow, it hits her sister, and so it causes her sister some great harm to her body and to her mind. And so they go and they find out that the only cure for this is that they erase the fact that her sister has these superpowers. And so they go and they, they get her help and the movie starts off really cute with this song called Do You Want to Build a Snowman? And so throughout this first scene they're building the snowman Olaf and, and as it continues to go for the first few minutes of the movie, Anna, who is now doesn't remember her sister can do this, she, but she can remember the snowman, and she's wanting to go and build a snowman with her sister. And so it shows them at different stages growing up, like 8 or 9, 12 years old, 16 years old, and she's going to Elsa's room. Elsa's now coming out because she knows what happened last time she heard her sister, and so she's isolated herself to her room. And so she goes to her room, and she's knocking on her door and singing the song, Do You Want to Build a Snowman? Later on in the movie, shortly after this, their parents go on a, on a they're going somewhere, and their ship crashes, crashes, and so now it's just Anna and Elsa. And so Elsa now, she becomes the queen of this place where they live, the queen of Arendelle. And on the outside, she looks very poised, very reserved, but she lives in fear of the secret that she hides from everyone else because she's been wearing gloves for years now. She's haunted by the moment where she almost killed her younger sister. She isolates herself, so it, it pans to her room, and her room is just full of ice and snow. So the day comes where she's going to be coronated, she's going to be the queen because mom and dad have died, and so now she's the queen, 
and she's wearing her gloves. She has to take them off to get the scepter and the, the chalice, and she goes to grab them, and they start to turn to ice because that's what happens when she touches things. She quickly puts her gloves on. A little bit later, she's arguing with her sister Anna about something, and Anna goes to grab her hand, and she pulls her glove off. And Elsie gets mad, and she, she loops her arm, and in front of everybody, everybody at this party, hundreds of people, they see her secret power is revealed. She Ice comes out of her hand and comes up in front of people, and people are scared by it. And so, Aunt, so Elsa leaves where she is, and she goes out and builds this ice palace in the middle of nowhere, away from everyone else, isolated completely from everybody that she knows. People try to come to her, try to save her, try to help her. She doesn't want anybody around her. And in the meantime, when she left, she turned the whole town to ice and snow. And it can only be changed by an act of love. I'm sure some of you could get up here and talk a little bit better about the movie Frozen. I've watched it several times with my daughters. But we see this girl who is hiding everything. She's hiding what's inside of her. She's hiding what could be a gift because of what happened in her past. I want to read a couple of scriptures to you this morning. The first one is this. It's 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. One of the things we love about scripture is it paints these pictures for us to understand scripture a little bit better. We get a picture of us standing somewhere and we have an enemy kind of just prowling around looking who he can devour. And being in ministry long enough, you see people getting devoured left and right. They find themselves disconnected from fellowship, di disconnected from their brothers and sisters, and they find themselves isolated from everybody and being devoured by the enemy. There's another scripture in John chapter 10. You've probably heard this. A lot of us have it memorized, but here's what it says. The thief, this is our enemy. The thief comes only, this is the only purpose, this is to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. It's a stark contrast that happens there. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, as we look to your word this morning, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that as we look to solitude, as we seek solitude in our lives, as we spend this time alone, as we get away from the distractions, that you would do just what you say, Lord, you will Refresh our hearts, refresh our minds, so that we can walk deeper with you every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isolation is, I think, one of the biggest challenges to the church world today. And I'll talk a little bit why, talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Self-reliance. But I want to start off with this statement. If solitude had an evil sister, her name would be isolation. The effects of isolation have been studied, they've been talked about. I read, I read about a study that happened at the University of Chicago, and it says researchers, researchers show lonely and non-lonely subjects photographs of people in both pleasant settings and unpleasant settings. When viewing the pleasant pictures, the non-lonely subjects show much more activity in the brain known as the ventral stratum than the lonely subjects. The ventral stratum plays an important role in learning. It's also part of the brain's reward center that can be stimulated by rewards like food and love. The lonely subjects display far less activity in this region, region while viewing pleasant pictures. And they also had less brain activity when shown unpleasant pictures. 
Have you ever heard of the phrase, misery loves company? These people who are in these situations, they find themselves, and even when they're showing something good, their brain can't even pick it up. It goes on and it says, when non-lonely subjects viewed the unpleasant pictures, they demonstrated activity in the, in the part of the brain where it's associated with empathy and compassion. And those that were lonely had a lesser response. What we find is, 